In Lesson 7 of The Power of the Seed and the dealing of the parable of the wheat and the tares, we want to take some time now and go into further interpretation of this parable. Remembering that these two parables are, uh, not only are they phenomenal, par- is it a phenomenal parable, but they are key to harvest. They're focused around the harvest of God, the harvest of the kingdom, because the seed in the uh, parable of the sower was the word of the kingdom sown in our hearts. And then that word grows to a level of maturity, and God, Jesus sows us as seed throughout the world. So it's important that we see this and begin to uh, allow him to do that work, but also recognize the work he's doing in us and the process, both in ourselves and in others. Remember that parables are prophetic uh, and are a prophetic tool and show aspects of the kingdom or layers of kingdom truth. There is the layer of individual interpretation. You will not be able to understand its corporate application either locally or universally if you do not let God apply it personally. There will always be an individual interpretation of the word unless God or unless the Holy Spirit says otherwise. It's important for us to catch that. Second level is the layer of the local gathering interpretation. And although it will may not look exactly the same as the personal interpretation, there will be, the principles will be the same and you will be able to relate and help understand these things. Uh, thirdly, the layer of the interpretation that applies to the universal body of Christ. And of course, the all three levels are very important. We would like to skip one, usually the individual application, and move to the others. But if I don't understand the individual application, I won't understand who, how to apply it corporately and if I don't gather and, and go through mix, some experiences corporately, I'll misapply it as I begin to relate it to the larger body of Christ. So let's go into the uh, interpretation of this. And you'll note that we're taking this from the Weiss translation. And that's because it gives some more detail. And I believe it's a, it, not only is it accurate, but there are some things here we want to look at. Matthew 13, 36 to 39. Then having sent the crowds away, he came into the house. And his disciples came to him and saying, Make thoroughly clear at once to us the illustration of the bastard wheat of the field. Now, let's look at the principles found in this verse. You'll notice that it's called bastard wheat. It's not called a tares, but bastard wheat. And there's a reason for this. First of all, the explanation is not for the crowd, but for the disciples. Those who are being trained to follow in his steps. Not only those who are being trained to listen and academically understand what he's saying, but those who are having an impartation into their spirit and he begins to unlayer, if I could put it that way, he begins to unlayer this parable of the kingdom. Pardon me. Note that the disciples knew it was important truth. That's why they said, show it to us one, at once. Make it clear to us at once. Answering, he said, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ himself sows this seed. By the way, if he sows it, you can't choose when to go or where to go. He reaches into the seed bag. He sows the seed. Moreover, the field is the world. The good seed... These are the sons of the kingdom. 
pardon me. So the field is the world. Good seed are people. They're a people. They're not children of the kingdom. As the King James would have us uh, believe, although there is an aspect of that there, but they're sons of the kingdom. That speaks of a level of maturity with the Father. Hmm. These people have allowed the word to be of the kingdom to become flesh in them. They've allowed God to work in them the invisibles that the principles and the word of the kingdom speak of. And he calls them sons. He calls them sons. Interesting. Matthew thirteen thirty eight. But the bastard wheat represents the sons of the pernicious one and the enemy. The one who sowed it is the devil, just in case you have any doubt. And the harvest is the consummation of the age or the ages, and the harvesters are the angels or the ministries, angelic ministries of God. Now in the scriptures sometimes, well, we'll come to that in a minute. Bastard seed are undisciplined sons of the enemy. Now let, let me make a, a little adjustment to that. Now I believe clearly they are uh, sons of the enemy. But I also believe Jesus said, if you are not disciplined or chastened by the Lord, then are you bastards and not son. That's why it's important to see that it's bastard wheat. One who has not let God work the word in them might well fit under this uh, category. The devil sowed them in the field. Not out somewhere else. In the field. Could I put it this way? The devil sowed them in the congregation. Please hear that. The consummation of the age is harvest time. The consummation of the age is harvest time. And angels are harvesters. Now, what I was going to say earlier is ministries are also called harvesters. Ministers are are also called angels. It's one of the interpretations that could be given in the in Revelation 2 and 3 when it talks about the angel of the church. Now I believe that there's both a minister of the church, a senior man, not a dictator, not a dominator, more like a coordinator. But there are also angels over every church. And I believe every church that God has called has an angel in charge of it. That angel is there because God is expecting a harvest in that assembly. Yes, he's expecting them to go out and harvest souls, and that's a different part of the harvest, but he's also expecting a harvest in the church. And he has angels awaiting that. Oh, I wish we could hear it. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels on a mission, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all those who create stumbling blocks for others and those who make a practice of lawlessness, and they shall throw them into the furnace of fire there in that place. There shall be the lamentation and the gnashing of teeth. Now, the sun determines the harvest and the sun determines when the harvest is ripe. Please hear that. Yes, I can hear a number of you saying, but when Jesus was here, when he was speaking to the woman, uh, to the disciples, 
at the well after they'd come back and brought, brought food. He said to them, the harvest truly is right, ready, but the laborers are few. And it's quite possible, in those days, of course, the men wore turbans, it's quite possible that he saw the turbans, the white turbans coming over the crest of the hill. But see, that's a layer of truth that has obstructed a deeper layer. Not on purpose, but because of our literal minds, our legal thinking. Again, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. There is literal truth, but it is only a type and shadow of spiritual truth. We need to catch that and walk the balance between those two dimensions of truth. The angels gather out of his kingdom the people who create stumbling blocks and are lawless. Mm. They gather it out of his kingdom. You can't gather something out if it isn't in. And so we need to say, Lord, first of all, in my kingdom, in the kingdom of God within me, gather out of me that within me which causes a stumbling block and that which tends to lawlessness. That which is unwilling to submit to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus to bring me to a place of being free from the law of sin and death. Those who are gathered out and those things that are gathered out of his kingdom are burned in a contained place or a furnace. And it says, there was weep in the King James, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Here in the West it says, there shall be lamentation and gnashing of teeth, or they shall complain about their fate. In Matthew thirteen forty three. Then those who are righteous, like the sun when it bursts through the clouds which have hidden it, shall shine forth through the world of evil, dissipating the darkness of sin which has obscured the good and veiled the true glory of their righteousness in the kingdom of their Father. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Only after the tares are removed do the righteous release the fullness or turn is the fullness of their light turned up and dispels the rest of the darkness. The glory has been veiled in the wheat all the time. In one sense you could say that it's going to be thrashed now, I lived in Christian community for a while, and one of the, uh, one of the spring times, they asked me to process the wheat to get it ready for sowing in the field. And we had this big old machine that you'd pour the wheat in the top, and there would be, uh, because we didn't have electricity, there was this uh, wheel that you, you spun, had a handle, and it shook several trays within, and it activated a fan in the back that blowed away. And what happened is often the chaff, any chaff left, chaff was blown away. In other words, that which hid the true wheat was blown away. The seeds too small went down to the bottom. I think we used them for feed for the animals so nothing was wasted. But the seed that was good was then gathered and sown in the field. And so there's going to be a process at the end, a process that the wheat goes through that takes away all that which has been veiling 
the true substance of God that's been worked in them. The focus until that time has been on sin obscuring glory. How do you know, Dr. Bill? Because it said, Then shall the righteous shine forth. After the tares have been removed, after the stumbling blocks and the things in me that offend have been removed from me, they have been, as it were, they have been clouding my globe, they have been clouding my light, after they've been removed, then shall the righteous shine forth. The first level we should hear on is how this applies to me. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That phrase denotes layers of truth. And so we want to at least help you with some layers of that truth. The mirror of the word requires that we see ourselves the ap and the application to ourselves first. When the priest came to wash at the laver, when he looked into the laver, it was lined with the mirrors of the women. And boy, is there a message in that one. But we're not going there today. It was lined with the mirrors of the women. And he saw himself. If his hat was on wrong, he saw that. If there was blood on his face, he saw that from the killing of the sacrifices. If there was blood on his garments, he saw that. He saw himself. He did not see others. So the first application should be seeing ourselves. Asking God, how does this word apply to me? Now, after cleansing myself by the word, how does it apply locally? How can I see it applied to the body at large, or do I just pray? Don't ever move without instruction from heaven. Proverbs 20, and verse 12, The hearing ear and the seeing eye the Lord hath made even both of them. We need to say, Lord, make or create in me around this parable a hearing ear. Isaiah 50 verse 5, The Lord hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Again, an, uh, a focus of prayer. Lord, open my ear. Lord, deal with any rebellion against this working in me. Lord, help me to go full on or straightforward in the application of of these truths. This has been quite a study and I hope it has helped you. Uh, it's helped me to review it and go through it and as I said as I was preparing some of this stuff this the Lord gave me new fresh stuff as well which we incorporated in this. But we pray that you've really heard what the Spirit is saying to the church. Here's our contact information, Dr. William J. Hurst, 1050 Constitution Park Boulevard, Rock Hill, South Carolina, 29732 is our snail mail address, 570-665-9115 is my cell number. It is also the only phone uh, that I have for uh, ministry and personal use, so I ask that unless you have some type of emergency that you really need to get a hold of me, that you do it by email or by snail mail. Uh, in the, if you send it by email, if you have questions or comments uh, on this or other things, uh, send it via email and by the grace of God I'll answer uh, those things via the email and um, I won't miss anything that you ask me. Uh, I've done that when people have asked me on the phone or uh, Skype or whatever because I don't always remember everything you tell me. Uh, sometimes in the pressure of the moment and uh, 
when God has uh, lit something up that you've said that's important to you, I forget the rest of what you said. So, uh, humor my humanity and send your uh, emails with your questions. On There's also there my um, website address. There you'll find uh, deeper teachings or more extensive, extensive teachings on these things in different courses that we've done. The courses are available for two reasons. Number one, you can do it for personal study. And all that will cost you is the uh, cost of the uh, textbook. Or you can do it for uh, ecclesiastical degrees. And that, of course, costs more because uh, there's more processing to it, and it's usually uh, much more extensive work for both you and I. Also, there you'll find DVDs, series, and individual messages. You'll find CD, series, and individual messages. So, um, go there. See what you can find. Also, you will find a donate button. And we ask you to pray and ask the Father if you're to help us and if you are, whatever he saith unto you, do it. All contributions are gratefully accepted and appreciated. This is Dr. William J. Hurst of Dr. William J. Hurst Ministries and the Institute for Strategic Christian Leadership teaching all nations the practical word of God and mentoring students one student at a time. May God give you great meditation and inspiration and revelation through what we've shared is our prayer. God bless you.